I'm going to be talking about um, the inundation model that I've been developing in the last year or so, um, and and the the NISI consultancy that we did to to um, bring in some visualization features uh, onto the model. And so, the the model itself is the result of some um, strategic uh, funding, research funding from NIWA uh, through several projects and. Um, and then there's the uh, visualization um, part that NISI did as the consultancy was separate from that. Um, so I'm a hydrodynamics modeler, but really I, I do a lot of work on creating hazard inundation hazard assessment and also a little bit on forecasting uh, inundation hazards. Now, um, inundation is really what I use, the definition that I use is when water comes where land is normally dry, um, a, a lot of people also use the word flood interchangeably between inundation, but um, I'm, I'm more familiar. I used to use the word inundation. Um, my American colleague tend to think that this is not the right way of saying this, but anyway. Um, and it's not just about the rivers, it's um, also tsunami, uh, storm surge. Actually, my, my expertise is more on waves and storm surge, but, but I do a fair bit of work in, in rivers and also uh, from from intense rain that we call surface flooding or, or just, you know, inundation from just rain. Um, to do these assessments, we rely a lot on um, numerical models and physics-based numerical model, that is, um, because they're, they're, really, they're really reliable, but also at the same time, we can um, throw, uh, we can play a little bit with, say, um, introducing a new stop bank and seeing the effect of a new stop bank will do on, um, an inundation from a river, or what if we build a seawall? Is that enough to protect from a given tsunami? Um, and also, how how all this the these feature will interact with the flow and things like that. So the, these physics-based models are, are really really um, what we rely on to make a lot of the assessments. Um, now we also use a lot of data to verify that the, the models behave the way they do. Um, but because they're physics-based, and because we want to see things in really high detail. Um, running those numerical models really, really slow. And, um, and there's always a, some sort of um, uh, a challenge between deciding on whether we're going to focus on a very small area and we're going to miss out some of the cascading effect of, so some of the effect of scales. Um, say, if we want to see the inundation from a cyclone on a river, are we focusing on the river or are we focusing on the scale of a, of a tropical cyclone, say? or or a big tsunami, are we focusing on an area where there's houses or are we simulating the whole bay? And really when the models are slow, we have to, to make these, um, these choices that are not very, um, uh, really not the choice that we want to make. So two years ago, we decided that um, we needed to write our own model um, in NIWA um, that would be fast, but also able to, um, take into account all those different scales. Um, and we decided to do that because there was, we had quite a bit of a vision on how this could work. Um, there's a model called Bacillus that we've been using for a while that's really, really slow, um, but was able to capture all these different scales. And in the past, I've used GPU to make numerical models of, of wave inundation run much, much faster. So we decided, well, maybe we should just jump in and, and make this happen. So we decided to create a model that would be good to simulate different inundation hazards, so whether it's tsunami, storm surge, river, rainfall, or even waves. Here I grade up the waves part because um, it's, we see that as a future work, so it's a bit more complicated. Um, we wanted a model that had an adaptive mesh and more precisely a form of quad tree, and, and this is really a block uniform quad tree that we're using. That's the picture on the right that you're seeing. Um, the quad tree, because it's really easy to set up, it doesn't need a lot of uh, human intervention to create, um, say that, that that's the kind of problem that we have with adaptive mesh based on triangles. They're really hard to make very nice, neat uh, triangular mesh. Um, it requires quite a bit of work, um, whereas quad trees are really, really easy to set up. We wanted it to run on GPU so we could benefit from the, um, the massive parallel um, of GPUs. And we also wanted to do a few things where um, the idea being cutting the load of some of the work that I do, for example, as making um, 
the forcing really easy, really flexible, um, and, and quite lightweight. So we could then decide to run tens of or hundreds of different models and automated the whole process. So we jumped in on this journey, and all what I'm going to show you now are um, a results of the model with a block uniform quad tree that is actually so uniform that there's only one level uh, in the quad tree. So it, it, it's really just a regular grid, but made of blocks. So this is really the first step of how this model and this vision that we have is meant to work. Um, and I want to show you a little bit on how um, it's really important or it's really difficult to capture all the scales. So for example, here, this is tsunami propagation across um, the Pacific Ocean, and this is running on, on the model that we developed. So here we needed a, a spherical correction. Um, we need to run on a very big scale. This is seven kilometer resolution. So each pixel that you can probably can't see because they're too small um, are about seven kilometer. kilometer. Um, and the idea of, of showing you this model is to show how the, comple the complexity of the wave offshore. Now, with this information, that's not very useful to decide whether there is inundation or not. Um, to do this, we need to bring uh, the waves all the way to the shore. And this is one of the examples here. This is um, some work that really, this is something that came out yesterday uh, from a simulation I did yesterday um, of uh, tsunami propagation in Samoa. So that's the trying to reproduce the 2009 tsunami in Samoa. Um, and here we go from the bigger scale, which is 250 meter. That's the bigger picture on the left. On the top right, we have the nested model at 50 meter. And uh, on the bottom right, we have the nested model of the top, the bottom right corner of uh, Upolu at 10 meter resolution. Now, because our right now the model is really just a uniform model, uh, a uniform resolution model, we have three different models, but ultimately we want to have that within one mesh um, that smooth. That, that joins uh, seamlessly all those all those scales. This example here is um, a model of uh, river inundation from Nandi. So still the same model. Um, here instead of a tsunami, we we have a river, and in this particular case, we just use um, we just force the river at the boundary of the model, and we just let the water flows around. Um, this model is redoing a, um, an analysis that was done um, a few years ago by um, some a research team in NIWA. And they, um, this model took quite a long time to run. I can't remember exactly. I think it was uh, several days. Um, whereas on the GPU, this is on the, on the desktop GPU I have here behind me, um, which is a Tesla K40. Uh, we we're able to run this in about three hours. So, um, and I think I'm actually running a bit longer than, than they bothered doing um, a few years ago. So this is really, we're really stuck with this because that means we have a useful product. That, that's not what our goal was, but so far um, we have a model that's really fast and doing what we want to do. Here's another example um, on some of the research that we're doing in Waikanae. And this is the different way of forcing the model. And, and really what happened on the, on the on the left-hand side with nine rivers is what people bothered doing. Um, but when you're forcing the model just on the boundaries or just up the river, you're missing a lot of the water that's falling on the catchment. So uh, in the middle, what we did is we ran a model. Because the model is so easy to set up, we can automatically generate boundary condition. And, and, and here I basically run a model with 300 rivers, uh, see what, whether that would slow down the model a lot and what would be the difference. And those 900 injection points are really to account for the water that falls within the catchment. But also at the same time, we wanted to make sure that, well, actually, we, we don't want to use those injection points. We, we want to use the rain that falls on the catchment and see where that rain is falling. And that's the, the model result on the right-hand side. Um, and you see the difference is, is quite massive on the extent of the inundation. Um, but these models with the rain, they they are really, really slow to, to run normally. And in this particular case, we were able to run that overnight. So we were quite happy with that. Now, all these models that I showed you only had um, a uniform quad tree um, and zero level uniform quad tree. So that's in a quad tree block uniform quad tree layout, it looks like what these three blocks would be, where ultimately and hopefully before the end of the 
the financial year will be able to do this, which is um, having multiple levels that connect seamlessly. Um, now, so the, num the color here that you see is the different levels, so it's different resolution. Each time you jump to another block, that's, uh, have, you have the resolution of the model, and you can only have the resolution when you jump from one block to the other. So the neighbors all have only one level up or down. Um, and that makes, that this layout is really suitable and really, really good for GPU. So there's a paper from Vacondio that came out in 2017 where they showed that memory layout and how efficient it was to, to, to run quad trees on the GPU this way. Um, but now one thing that you can see is, well, when we want to visualize uh, the model output, we have to look at what's on the left-hand side, but what's in the memory of the model is what's on the right-hand side. And it's not necessarily too easy to rebuild one from the other. Another issue that we have is that, well, block uniform quad trees are not a very um, widespread mesh layout, so there's not a lot of support for it. Um, and when we, when I started developing the, the, um, the block uniform quad tree with multiple levels, I got stuck pretty quickly because uh, although I could lay out things within the memory, I didn't have really a, um, a format that I could save onto the disk and really look at what, what the result was and making sure, I, making sure that I was uh, doing the right things. So, um, yeah, we, we looked at different options. Um, now, for example, NetCDF is what everyone normally works on. It doesn't really natively support block uniform factory. Now, it, you can trick, you, there's a few tricks to make it work, but it's not, it's not super easy. So basically the, the trick is that for each level, you create a separate variable that you consider as a, um, as a uniform grid. And that's fine if you have two or three levels, but if you have eight levels and you want to watch, look at the results of your model in a, um, say in a GIS file, then you can load them, but you have to load eight different variables to see the whole mesh. So not necessarily um, a, a deal breaker, but probably not the best way of looking at this. Um, especially when you're trying to debug, it, it takes a lot of time. Now I looked at VTK because that seems quite a popular way of looking at mesh and it actually has a block uniform quadri support. Um, the problem is VTKs are not very, well, it's, the problem with VTK is that for each block, it will create a separate file. Then when you have millions of blocks, then suddenly you have millions of files that you have to load in Parview. And well, that's not really a very neat option either. Um, but well, Parview can handle it and will render the mesh properly. So that's actually quite, quite easy um, to use. So the other option was in-situ visualization. And initially I never thought I would go down this road because I, I don't know, I saw Wolfgang from uh, Nessie who also does some work at NIWA showed, showed the presentation at the coding conference and I was like, oh, that's neat. But uh, well, I'm never capable of doing that. But well, in the end, that's where Nessie, Nessie came in and uh, to help me pretty much solve this problem. Um, so we started talking about a year ago with uh, Nessie researchers. Um, the idea was not necessarily, for, for, for early on I saw that they had a lot of expertise that I could definitely um, benefit from. Uh, it wasn't very clear to me that visualization was really what I needed them to do for me um, at the time that we started talking anyway. Um, but it was it was very good experience, early discussion because um, I mean, when when I was coding this model is when we were starting, when we started to talk, and it's really hard when you deep in t inside the, the gut of the of the model, it's hard to see the forest from the quad tree, really. Um, and um, yeah, it was really good to sit down with with the crew um, and talk about what what I wanted to do. Initially, I wanted to work on the code optimization and some profiling, making it as fast as possible. But it was came came up in the discussion that it's not really a smart idea to do that while we're still developing. And then we started talking about how the visualization was, was quite a bit of a challenge. Um, now they helped me set up the project. It was, and, and the whole thing ran really smoothly with not much of my input, um, which was a bit of a relief um, when, you're, when you're writing a bit of code. And, and I have to say, I'm, I'm a researcher. I, I'm not a trained programmer. Um, so I do things very ad hoc. So 
it was always a bit of a relief that someone who, well, I guess is an expert um, programmer can find his way through the mess of code that I created, then that was a bit of a relief. So the way that the, um, the visualization work is, is really cool is it's part of the PowerView Catalyst adapter that um, Nessie coded. And what it does is within the model, it renders an image um, from the model parameter and save the image to the disk. Now, because of it relies on the same process that creates a VTK file, we can also save to a VTK file. And also, because of the way uh, Catalyst work with PowerView, um, we can actually view the model um, memory. Well, not just the memory, the way that it's arranged in the memory, but we can view the, the quad tree, the block uniform quad tree, arranged properly um, through PowerView. So that means when I launch the model, I can launch PowerView and view the results of that. Um, and, and really, this is. The point of all this is that it changed the workflow um, that I normally work with, with, with the model. Um, normally it would go like this, I would just run a model, save on the disk as an etcdf file, and then go through a bunch of software that are producing nice figures and nice animation that you saw earlier. Where now um, I'm able to, well, save VTK file if I want to, which that's actually quite useful even if it creates thousands of files, um, because that allows me to play and learn a bit more to use PowerView. And then I can actually force the model with a Python script that use the same rendering scripts that PowerView and that actually produce in situ um, JPEG. And this is an example of a JPEG um, right at the bottom for, for, for one of the model that we ran. And that's, although I see that as being useful to make simulation of animation, I'm not sure this would produce publication grade figures. It's just such a relief for debugging because I don't have to go through this extra step in the workflow to go through the NetCDF file and try to render the NetCDF file, especially if I um, mess up the um, where the actual block should be located, um, which I did several times. Uh, the in-situ visualization, I haven't, uh, sorry, the live visualization, I haven't been able to test it yet um, in, in my machine. Um, uh, and that's because I, I well, I, yeah, it's, um, you, I had to compile a power view and that took, took a while and then I got stuck in there instead. Um, but that's really cool as well. I think for, for development, that means um, I'm probably going to shift the development of the model to another machine where you can do the live visualization and go through the gut of the model to, um, to, to try to see where the problems are, are, are appearing in the development. Now it seems a bit might seems a bit strange that um, live visualization is used as a development tool like th there's a phase of development where this is really useful and then it sounds like well maybe after a while we won't need it but um, I, I, I see that we'll need it for a while because when we're done with the hydrodynamics we want to introduce um, a wave model a wave component of the model and that means we have to basically start again start again from scratch with a an all new algorithm to deal with just the waves part. Um, and there's several ways of doing this, which means either we pick one of those ways or we do code all different ways of simulating the waves, which is sort of, we'll see how that goes. Um, I'm off to a conference next week where I'm basically gonna ask for help for someone to, to help me code the waves part. Um, so going back to how the consultancy work, it, it it can help you, it helped me, it can help anyone. It's really, it was really good to be able to talk about code and, and it's not, you don't get a lot of people that you can sit down and talk to them about a piece of C++ code. And um, and really that's that's what I really enjoy about the beginning of the Nessie consultancy is being able to sit down and, and talk about what would be nice to do, what can be done. And, and then suddenly someone else can come in and jump in the code and and write a, a lot of really good stuff. Um, I had a lot of added value to my consultancy. It was not necessarily just the visualization part. Um, I Chris coded the, um, a new building process using um, CMake instead of my old make file that I just kept modifying. 
that was quite neat in the end. Um, and something that I probably wouldn't have tried to do on my own, uh, not knowing CMake and it all sounded quite scary. Um, and I guess, yeah, as I said earlier, uh, one thing that felt pretty good done in the end was that my code makes sense to someone else. And that's, wow, that was a bit of a relief too. <laughs> and sort of gave me a bit of a boost in being like, yeah, this is the right way forward. This is something that can be useful to someone else. And, and I can try to bring in someone else to help on coding some of the what we have in the, in the pipe. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Cyprian. Um, just to address, there's maybe a couple of latecomers. It looks like the wrong Zoom link was sent on in a reminder email. So apologies if that affected you. And we'll have this recorded so that people that were affected by that can watch the talk at a later time. But now I'm just going to pass things over to Chris, who's going to explain what working with Nessie can look like for you, explain consultancy a little bit more. So over to you, Chris. Thanks, Megan. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, cool, yeah, and thanks, Cyprian, for the, for the nice presentation. Um, so so I've, I've just got a couple of slides here to, to talk about, um, you know, what type of work we do in a computational science team at Nessie, um, what the projects look like that we work on, um, and, and, you know, if you're interested how to find out more information or, or to apply for a project. Um, so, yeah, so the, this slide sort, sort of tries to give an idea of the types of work that we do, which is um, it's very varied. We, we can work on lots of different projects. Um, but we're, we're a team of research software engineers. So often there's some sort of programming involved, um, but there doesn't have to be. So, so we can do custom code development, maybe adding, adding some new functionality into your code. We do a lot of optimization and parallelization work to make sure your code, you're getting your results as fast as possible. Um, we can do things like writing code for GPUs, if that makes sense for your, for your work. Um, and as Cyprian just gave a nice example of, um, you know, adding visualization capabilities. Um, and we can also do things like improving software sustainability. So, you know, better build systems, testing frameworks, you know, help, help getting started using version control and the, these types of things. Um, but there's, there's a very broad range of work that we do. Not that, that this isn't exclusive. Um, and how the projects work. So, you know, if you, if you get a project approved, um, you, know, you get one or more of our Nessie research software engineers to work with you. Um, it, it's done as a collaboration. So, you know, we're putting time in, but there's ex expectation that you put some time in as well to have regular meetings. Um, and the reason for this is that, you know, at, at the end of the project, at the end of the project, um, you take full ownership of the end product. So you, you need to be comfortable with all the changes that we make and you need to, you need to drive the, the project really, I guess. Um, uh, one of the aims is, one of the main aims is to transfer some knowledge into the research group. Um, so, so we get to learn a bit about what you're doing, but hopefully you get to learn something from us as well. And, and then you can apply that later on in, in your research. Um, the, the projects themselves typically last for a few months of time, but it, it's, it's, it's basically bespoke. So some projects last for less and some go for longer. Um, and we, we typically work about one day a week on these projects, so it's not full time. Um, and there is a need to apply for a project um, and you need to get the project needs to get approved. Um, and and I really the one requirement that we ask is that, you know, after the project finish finishes, um, that you'll contribute to a case study, which is basically showcasing the work that you're doing that Nessie's supporting. I mean, it's not a big deal, I guess, the case studies. It doesn't take a lot of your time to do that. And finally, just quickly, you know, if, if you're interested to find out more or you want to apply, um, I guess the important thing is that, you know, you need to have a Nessie project to be able to apply for a consultancy. Um, so you have to go through the standard project request on the uh, Nessie website. Um, but if you do have a merit or postgrad project, or you have a project from a collaborator, so University of Auckland, University of Otago, Niwa, or Maneki Fanua Landcare Research, um, you shouldn't have to pay for consultancy. Um, and we usually recommend that you talk to us about your proposal first. Um, I think Cyprian mentioned as well, it's, it's just good to talk with other people about your code and you know, some, some ideas can come up that you hadn't thought of before. Um, so yeah, we, we, we're always keen to talk to people first and you, you, you can get in touch at the email address there um, and we can set up a Zoom meeting to talk to you about you know, what your ideas are for a project. Um, usually we just complete the application form together to make it easier for you rather than having to do it yourself. Um, yeah, and once, if an application gets approved, um, then, then the 
you know, the project goes ahead. Um, so yeah, that, that's all I really had to say. But um, yeah, we're really happy to take questions or you can contact us later, um, anytime. Right. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, so now uh, we will open the floor up for anyone that has questions for either Cyprian or Chris. Um, and yeah. Any thoughts or questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and um, ask away. I'm interested, Cyprian, to. So I know you, you said you heard um, it was a presentation by Wolfgang that you saw what he was kind of working on. And um, with that, that was the prompt that got you thinking that maybe an SE consultancy would be helpful for your work. Is that how you kind of got into the uh, collaboration to begin with? Actually, no. Um, it if I did see that presentation for Wolfgang, so that was at um, not this year's, but last year's um, science coding conference, uh, New Zealand science coding conference. And initially I thought, oh, this is neat. But I, I thought this was more of a research type. Um, and I didn't think of it as something that could be plugged in in, in my code, for example. But um, I think it was a few months later, I saw Wolfgang at the airport. And we started talking again, and, and then he, he suggested it. And I was like, oh, really? So that's something we can do. And, and yeah, that, that's really at that point where I was like, oh, oh, why not? Why not? Awesome. So did I hear someone else have a question or any other questions? I'll give everyone a minute to have a think. And if there aren't any questions, then I will go ahead and share a last wrap up slide. Um, just a thing to bring to your attention. It was already brought up, but for the vast majority of Nessie users collaborating with the computational science team is free. Um, and so if you want to find out if Nessie can help you, really, we would love to talk to you and you can contact us at any time. Um, emailing us at support at nessie.org.nz is always a safe way to get in contact with us. Um, you will always be put into contact with the right person, whether it's Chris or someone else on the team. Um, you can also find more information on the Nessie website on consultancy. Um, there's a link there that um, is also in the question document and the little resources section. So if you want to go check out what exactly consultancy is, go click on that link. And then there's also an opportunity for you guys to check out some other new Nessie case studies on the website. The, the link to that is on that uh, question doc as well. Are there any last minute questions? from anyone. All right. Here's the link, guys. Um, thank you very much for coming and apologies for anyone who wasn't able to come on time. It was an error on my part. So we will have the recording and we'll send it out to everyone who registered. Um, thank you guys and See you all later. Thank you for coming.